yes, I am recording now. So, everybody, nice to meet you all. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank Ayala for that uh, lovely introduction. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I, every time I tell this story here, um, I, I learn something new about it. And it really is an amazing story. And I'm, I'm hoping to kind of share what we say in America. We say a little bit of inside baseball on kind of what happened and how it happened and, and everything like that. And, 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 and um, you know, I think it was because of Ayala hearing me talk about this in Palo Alto uh, a couple of weeks ago that uh, I got connected to your group here. So um, it's my pleasure to be here. And, and I want to thank uh, Shifi and Ayala and, and, and the entire group for, uh, for being here. And um, I'd just like to ask a couple of things. First of all, if you have questions, probably the best place to put them is the chat. And we'll uh, have a way to, um, to get to them at, at, at various points during the, um, during the presentation. Uh, I'm also going to ask everybody to be responsible for their own muting, so please mute yourself. And uh, everybody can hear me, right? Get a little thumbs up here. All right, fantastic. Great. All right, so now I'm going to share my screen here. Whoops. Let's do that. Let's do the share here. And that. And that. Here we go. Can everybody see this? I assume everybody can see this. If not, let me know, uh, and I'll make it a little bigger so we can all see it on the screen here. There we go. Okay, so we're going to be talking tonight about really an amazing journey, uh, and it's a journey home of what I call the journey for the Olomouc Torah. Now, one of the questions that we had when we first got to the uh, to the town in the Czech Republic was, "How do you pronounce it?" And it looks like Olomouc. But apparently we were, we were told by the people that live in Olomots that it actually is pronounced Olomots, like Olomots, but Olomots is the way that you pronounce it in Czech. So I wanna uh, uh, tell you a little bit about the story and, and it really is a story that goes back almost 200 years. Uh, and really actually maybe even a, even a thousand years if you wanna talk about the history of the, of the Jews of the Czech Republic. But just in, in basic terms here, it really is a story that's hard to believe. And we're still uncovering layers to this story. This story has been going on uh, for quite some time. So uh, in short, we returned a 200 year old Sefer Torah to its home community in Olomouc in the Czech Republic for the first time in 78 years. So just let that sink in for a little bit. Um, it really was amazing that this Torah found its way home. And um, we think that what we did, and, and what we did uh, in, in conjunction with the Memorial Stroll Shots, and I'll talk about them momentarily, is something that probably is never gonna happen again. Uh, and there's a reason for that, and I'll get to that when we talk about the community in Olomouc, but certainly what we did was emotional, it was historic, it was amazing, it was one of a kind. And, and so really, um, I, I just can't wait to tell you the story. So imagine our story kind of begins here. So imagine, if you will, kind of an anonymous sofer, an anonymous ritual scribe uh, in some little town in the Czech province of Moravia. Uh, he's sitting at his writing table and he's writing a Torah sometime around, we think around 1870, 1880, somewhere in there. And for those of you that know about, uh, about, this, uh, about uh, writing a sefer Torah it is a tremendously exacting process. And it is all done by hand and it's full of all kinds of rules and rituals uh, and uh, the Sofer actually is somebody with great skill who actually writes the scroll, not from memory, but actually by referring to a reference text, in this case, uh, another text to actually write the scroll. And he really toils away on this beautiful ritual object. And there's all kinds of stories about, you know, the, um, the calligraphy and the artwork. And, and, and it really is amazing. We learned a lot about that as, as well when we were in Olomouc. And I'll tell you maybe a little bit about that later. So this is the scroll here. And it came into possession of the Jews of Olomouc, uh, probably sometime after it was written. So sometime in the 1870s, 1880s, something like that, and was used in its community until the scroll left Olomouc somewhere around 1938, 1939, somewhere in there. So our story kind of begins here. So we are my community, Peninsula Sinai Congregation in Foster City. We are fortunate to have two scrolls, two of them on loan from the London-based Memorial Scrolls Trust, 
And we have had both of those scrolls in our community for 40 years. Now, the scrolls were allocated to us by the trust, and I'll talk about them, as I said, in a moment. Um, and we have sheltered those scrolls in our community since 1970. And they've had an honored place in our community. I'm one of the uh, Bale Kriya, I'm one of the uh, Torah readers. Uh, and so I've been reading from that scroll probably for 30 years or 25 years, ever since I've been part of the community on Shabbat and Chagim and, and the whole thing. So I've, re I've read from that scroll for decades. I've read actually from both of the scrolls for decades. But really, our story begins with an email. And it was an email that was sent to a guy by the name of Jeffrey Orenstein, who was the chair of the Memorial Scrolls Trust. And it was sent by this guy on the left here. His name is Roman Gronsky, who happened to be visiting his family in London and actually went to see the organization that um, has the scrolls in London. And he wrote, uh, uh, basically in, on January 8th of 2016, he writes an, an email to our rabbi, Rabbi Corey Helfand. And the rabbi, uh, and the, and the email was basically as follows. He says, I hope you don't mind, but an unusual situation has arisen. So this is Jeffrey Orenstein writing to our rabbi, Rabbi Helfand. He says, we had a visitor, Roman Gronsky, uh, to our museum in London, and whose father had escaped and fought in the Czech army and returned to Olomouc after World War II. Jeffrey, I received a note from the president of the community who was exploring the possibility of loaning an Olomouc Torah to his community. Peninsula Sinai has scroll number 740 from the Memorial Scrolls Trust that came from Olomouc, and I'll tell you how we got it in just a moment. So Jeffrey goes on to write, this is the first time the Memorial Scrolls Trust has been approached in such a way. Can you please let me know what your community would think of this proposal? Hmm, well, that's interesting. Well, what actually prompted the request was a second email, email number two. And this email came from this guy on the right, on the left here, his name is uh, Peter Papushek, who is the um, president of the Jewish Federation of Czechoslovakia, of, of the Czech Republic and is also the president of the Shul in Olmos. And uh, he wrote an email to um, Jeffrey Orenstein, which said the following. He says, "I received." this is Peter Papushek writing. He says, I received information from Mr. Gronsky regarding the Torah scrolls from our former synagogue in Olmos. We're now in the process of getting any suitable to new, new Torah for our community because we have just one kosher Torah scroll and its status is deteriorating. It would be for us a great satisfaction to get one of the Torah scrolls, which was used by our grandfathers in Olamots. Our community has 164 members. We have regular Shabbat services. We have a kosher kitchen, and we have about 30 or 45 participants every Shabbat and every, during Shabbat and Chagim. Let us know if it's possible to receive one of the Torahs and what we should do in this matter. One of the conditions is that we need a kosher Sefer Torah. So this is from Peter Papushek. Okay, so a bunch of critical questions. Of course, this, our rabbi is reading both of these emails and he's saying to himself, oh, wait a minute, there's a lot of questions that I have here, right? And so among the questions were kind of the basic question, like what would it take to actually return one of the scrolls that we'd had for 40 years in our community? Second question, probably even more importantly is, would our community go for it? You know, we have some proprietary nature. We have some interest in these scrolls here. They've been with our community. They've been honored guests. We've used them. Would our community go for it? Would this be something that our community would agree to? Of course, how much would it cost? And how will we pay for it? It's not a simple matter to get a, a Torah scroll over to the Czech Republic. And could this really be the first time that such a request had been made? Okay. So that's the background, that's the background story. Now, to understand a little bit more about the history, and I'm not gonna go through a thousand years of Czech history, but don't worry. But uh, I think it's important to kind of understand a little brief history of time for the Czech Jews. So you have to understand that Jews had existed in, the, in, che in Czechoslovakia, at that time Czechoslovakia, since probably sometime before the 10th century. And they've been there in both um, they actually settled in the area around 995, the year 995 of the Common Era. And you can imagine that there were probably good times and bad times throughout the entire thousand year history. So I'm not gonna go through all of it, but let's talk a little bit about the good times, right? So this is an example of the good times. Now, if any of you have been to uh, Prague, you might remember, uh, you might have actually seen this statue. This statue stands in front of the city hall, the new city hall in Prague. 
And there's a guy, there's a statue of a guy by the name of Yehuda Leib ben Bitzalel, or Rabbi Loi, and he's commonly known as by his acronym uh, the Maharal, Moreno Harav Rabbi Rav, Moreno Harav Loi, our teacher Rabbi Loi. And you might also recognize his name because he was famous for coming up with the legend of the Golem of Prague. So he was a tremendously powerful guy and, a, and tremendously well-respected. This is his grave site in the old cemetery in Prague. And so you can imagine that if this guy to have a statue in front of the city hall in Prague means that he was a pretty important guy, right? And, uh, and probably a, a symbol of probably the good times for the Jewish community there. But there's also a flip side there because there's also the bad times, right? So just when you think you haven't made, you get something like this happening. So what does this mean here? So I want you to take a little look. Whoops, sorry about that. I want you to take a little look at this, at this photo here and ask yourself, what, what do you see in this photo here? What's weird about this photo? I should tell you that this is a statue, a photo statue that is on one of the iconic structures in Prague. It's called the Charles River Bridge. It's a big tourist site. Thousands of people there in, in you know, non-COVID times are there. And uh, there are all these statues that line the, uh, both, both railings of the, of the bridge, go from one side of the river to the other, one side of the, one side of the uh, Voltaba River to the other, okay? So what do you see that's weird about this picture here? Just think about- Kadosh, 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 Adonai Tzvaot. Yeah, right. Kadosh, 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 Adonai Tzvaot. Well, what in the world is that doing on a cross? Okay. So actually, this is an example of the bad times, right? Because the story goes that, and this is a bit of a legend, but it's a, it's a story that was re relayed to me by somebody who kind of knows this stuff. That the reason why you see kadosh 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 on the on the crucifix there on the on the on the crucifix on the crucified Jesus there is that the story goes that an old Jew was walking across the bridge and he spat on the cross, right? Not necessarily a very nice thing to do, probably. For, who knows what who knows what caused it? But it was a it was a it was a the, the authorities didn't look at that very kindly. Let's just put it that way. And so as penance for his punishment, if you will for having to uh, having the audacity to spit on the cross, he was forced to pay to fix the statue, if you will. And one of the things that they made him do was to put this iconic kadosh, 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 Adonai Tzavot, holy, 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 the Lord of hosts. This is from the Kedusha. This is every time a Jew prays in synagogue. This is there, right? Well, most every time, right? So this is kind of an in your face, right? And one of the things I, that I learned from this was that just when you think you have it made, right? Just when you have somebody like the Maharal, who's in charge of everything and is a great leader and people love the Maharal, then you get situations like this where, you know, things are not so good. So I think in, in, in summary, that kind of summarizes the history of the Jews of the Czech Republic. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what we've got here on the map here, just so you kind of, kind of orient yourself. So this here is Prague. This is a, a map here. This is Prague. It's the capital of, of Czechoslovakia. Of, of, I, I say the Czech Republic. You remember that, that um, Czechoslovakia split into two countries, uh, the Czech Republic and Slovakia in uh, 1988 during the Velvet Revolution. Okay. So this is Prague. And this here is Olomo. So it's about two, two and a half hours by car, maybe a little bit less by train uh, away from the, the capital of the, of the country in Prague. Now, down here, I just want to call out another city, Česka Budiovica. And by the way, the rabbi, uh, Rabbi Helfand jokes that I'm the only person in the community that knows how to pronounce it. Uh, but there's, a, there's more to the story than that. We won't spend a lot of time on Česka Budiovica. But actually, I visited down to Česka Budiovica. Česka Budiovica was, this, was the home of our second Torah scroll. So remember, we have two Torah scrolls from the Czech Republic. One we had from Olomots, and the second one we had from Česka Budiovica. Uh, I won't have a lot of time to talk about Česka in this talk. Uh, but there's a whole big story around that there uh, as well. So that gives you a kind of a geographic orientation. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Olomouc. Well, this is Olomouc. It's a beautiful town. If any of you have been there, I, I highly recommend it. It's, it's a gorgeous town. It's a world heritage site. What you see in the middle of the picture here, it's about two and a half hours outside of Prague by train. As I said, it's the historical capital of the province of Moravia. It's a university town. So there's a big ecclesiastical university uh, in the middle of Olomots, and it's probably the sixth largest town in the Czech Republic. So what you see in the middle of the picture here is this giant edifice, this giant statue here. It's called the Plague Tower. And I don't, I'm not a, I'm not a historical expert about this, but somebody told me 
that this was built uh, shortly after the end of the Black Death Plague. And it was built by somebody giving thanks for the, the deliverance that people had felt uh, you know, from the Black Death, from the Black Death, uh, the, end, the end of the Black Death. So, you know, that does have some resonance to kind of what we're going through right now with COVID. Uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people died, obviously, in Europe, and a lot of people have died here and, and are suffering tremendously because of that. Okay. And there's about 100,000 people that live in Olomouc. Let's talk about the Jewish history of Olomouc. This is a picture of what the synagogue at Olomouc used to look like. And I'll get to the history of the synagogue in just a second here. But we think that the community uh, existed since probably the 14th century. There, are, there were around uh, uh, 1890, uh, around the turn of the century or the turn of the, uh, uh, the 20th century, there were about 3,500 Jews uh, in the town. So you can see they built a beautiful synagogue here. Uh, it, it really was a gorgeous building. Um, and um, the synagogue was built in 1896. So again, probably an example of better times for the community. They were able to raise the funds to build such a beautiful building. But Unfortunately, the bad times, most of them in World War II, most of the Jews of Olomouc were deported, many of them to Theresen, which was a, uh, a, a deportation camp outside of Prague. And many of the people that lived, that went to Theresen went on to the death camps, to Auschwitz, to Treblinka, to other places. There's very, very few people that survived. About 90% of the community, the Jewish community uh, that was deported to Theresen perished in the Shoah. So by about 2017, our best guess is that there were about 164 community members in the community, okay? So let's talk a little bit about, as we said, about the community. They have regular Shabbat services. Well, that in and of itself is kind of miraculous, right? You know, 160, how could you support, you know, in that kind of a community, regular Shabbat services, and particularly a country that for the longest time was behind the Iron Curtain, and we'll get to that in a second as well. As I said, about 30 to 45 people participate every Shabbat. They have a kosher kitchen. The community is mostly lay led. It's probably um, Tom Orthodoxy. It's, it's, it's very much an Orthodox uh, kind of a community, although it has uh, you know, aspects of it that are not so Orthodox. And there's a bit of political stuff going on there as well, but it's primarily an Orthodox led community. And um, so let's talk a little bit now about, um, about moving along to learn about the history of the community. So, Many of you remember this historical picture here. This is a picture uh, with a guy holding up a piece of paper. His name was Neville Chamberlain. He was the prime minister of Great Britain. And you remember in September of 1938, he went, whoops, he went to visit uh, Adolf Hitler, who was the chancellor of Germany. And he tried basically to negotiate his way out of World War II. And he figured, well, as long as we kind of appease Hitler and we kind of, you know, uh, you know make nice to him, maybe he'll go away. And so he came back with this document, it's called the Munich Agreement, and he said, peace in our time. We made an agreement and we basically said to Hitler, okay, you can take what's called the Sudetenland, which is the area that immediately borders Germany and Czechoslovakia. You take the Sudetenland and everything will be fine. You just stop there and we'll be all good. Well, of course, we know that didn't happen, right? Because in the synagogue, and so this is a picture of the inside of the synagogue here. You can see it's a beautiful building, just gorgeous. This happened. So on March 15th, 1939, the Nazi armies marched from the Sudetenland and basically took over uh, Czechoslovakia without firing a shot. And when they arrived in Olomouc, the very, very first thing that they did was, guess what? They burned the synagogue to the ground, right? So peace in our time, not so much, right? And this is a picture on the right here of the synagogue actually burning. And what you see kind of interesting in the front here, you see a bunch of horse-drawn carts there. That is the Czech Municipal Fire Brigade. The Nazis stopped the firefighters from putting out the flames. They wanted to make a statement. They wanted to destroy the synagogue. So today, if you go to Olomouc, there's no synagogue. That building is gone. That is what the building looked like. Here's another picture of it here. Today, it's a parking lot. And what's interesting about that parking lot is that site is still owned by the Jewish community in Olomouc. So if you park your car in Olomouc, you actually, they actually get some recurring revenue from the people that park their cars in the parking lot there. But the synagogue was never rebuilt. And there's a variety of reasons for it, not the least of which is that 90% of them perished in the Shoah. So there, weren't, there wasn't really a critical mass to be able to, um, you know, to rebuild that synagogue. So now let's talk a little bit about Torah scrolls. So 
Many of you might have heard the story here, and I'm just going to um, highlight a couple of things here. Um, as the war was getting worse and worse, so basically from 1938, 1939, as things were getting really bad for the Jews of, the Ch of Czechoslovakia, an effort was made by the Jewish community to send Sifre Torah and precious ritual objects to Prague for what they called safekeeping. Okay. Now, there's also a bubamice around this, which I'm going to debunk in just a second here. But basically, um, the the efforts to to safeguard uh, Sifre Torah and Jewish ritual objects was actually done at the behest of the Jewish community. It was not, as some people would say, because the Nazis decided they wanted to form a museum to an extinct race. That is a bubamisa that has existed for years, and it is 100% not true. The efforts to save the Sifre Torah from Olomots and hundreds of other Jewish communities that were being afflicted by the Nazis was initiated by the Jews of the Czech Republic. Now, what happened was they sent them to what was called at the time the Jewish Museum, which had existed um, since about the 1890s. So the, the, the museum had existed for many, many years before World War II. And as I said, the Jewish community sent the ritual objects to the museum thinking, well, you know, after the war is over, maybe we'll be able to come back to it. Maybe we'll be able to come, you know, to, to, you know, to, to repatriate our, our, our lost objects, et cetera, et cetera. Well, of course, that didn't happen. But what actually did happen, as you see in this picture here on the left, is that the inventory inside the Jewish Museum in Prague swelled to about 14 times its normal size. And eventually, 50 warehouses and dozens and dozens of buildings and synagogues and warehouses were to the rafters with Jewish ritual objects, Torah scrolls, Seder plates, wedding rings, violins, stained glass windows, you name it. And this is an example of some of the collection here. So one of the things that happened was that the curators of the museum on seeing all these Sifre Torah on the left coming in, decided that it was in their interest to kind of catalog where these scrolls came from. And so they took it upon themselves at great risk, by the way, I must say to their own safety, to put little tags on each of the, on each of the Sifre Torah that indicated where they came from. And the scrolls were, were, were given with all that information. Now, many of them were damaged by fire and by water. Many of them were in bad shape. Many of them had notes written inside from the communities in which they came from. Help me, save me, we're, we're dying. You know, all kinds of stuff. You know, the, the, the condition of the scrolls was really all over the map. And these heroic curators like um, Joseph Pollock, who was the chief curator, and Tobias Jakobitz, Jakobowitz, who was the chief librarian of the Prague Jewish community, at risk to their own life and basically under the noses of the Nazis, decided to catalog these Sifre Torah. And you can see some of the collection on the left there. Now, that's interesting, right? So what happened was, uh, this is a picture of the uh, Jewish Museum. If you ever visit uh, Prague, I highly recommend a visit to the Jewish Museum. It's in the Jewish quarter of Prague. It's a beautiful area, many many old synagogues. It's, it's gorgeous. But this is one of the buildings. It's actually the building where the Chevra Kedisha was housed uh, in, in, um, in the Jewish quarter of Prague. And this building here was eventually where, where about 1,800 Torah scrolls were stored, because again, they were running out of room. They didn't know what to do with them. And so basically they just moved them to where they could find space for them. And this is a, this is a building called the Mishli Synagogue outside of Prague, where those 1800 Torah scrolls sat basically from 1939, 40, somewhere like that, up until the end of the war, okay? Now, what happened, and, and these, are, these are an example, okay, so let me, let me ask you go back here. So they sat here in the Mishli Synagogue until the end of the war. Now, in 1948, for those of you that don't know, so 1945, the Nazis lose, thank God, uh, you know, and the end of the war, thank God. But in 1948, there was a coup d'etat in Czechoslovakia, and the, um, uh, the people that took over were communists. And let's just say the communist regime in Czechoslovakia was certainly not friendly to religion in general, and was absolutely not friendly to the Jews. Right? It was a pretty repressive, it's probably one of the most repressive, repressive regimes behind the Iron Curtain. But in 1964, a 
art dealer by the name of Eric Esterich, who was an American art dealer, uh, was visiting Prague. He actually had visited Prague many times uh, during the uh, during the post-war years, and had come to Prague in the night in the in the early 1960s to find artwork for his uh, you know, to sell to find artwork to buy and to sell. And um, he was approached by Archia, which was a company run by the Czech Communist government. Um, and basically, they said to him, Mr. Esterich, we have 1,800 Torah scrolls that are sitting in this in this museum, in this uh, warehouse in the Mishli Synagogue. Would you be interested in buying them? Now, why would they want to do that? Well, you know, one of the reasons was, the, you know, that uh, the communist government was hurting for currency. They needed, uh, you know, Western currency. And so they, and, and, and basically, since 90% of the Jews had perished, there was nobody to come back and claim these scrolls here. So as far as they were concerned, they had no use for them, right? So they approached Mr. Esterich and they said, will you buy them? Well, Mr. Esterich approached a guy by the name of Ralph Yablon, who was a member of the Westminster Synagogue in London. And he was a very wealthy gentleman, an, an entrepreneur and a very wealthy gentleman. And Mr. Yablon approached the rabbi of the synagogue, Rabbi Harold Reinhardt, and basically they cooked up a plan to purchase the scrolls. So all 1800 Torah scrolls were purchased and sent to London and actually are, uh, today are on display in the Memorial Scrolls the Scrolls Trust Museum, and you can see an example of some of them here. So what happened basically, whoops, what did I do there? I didn't mean to do that. Let's go back here. Sorry about that. Go back a couple of lines here. Uh, sorry about that. Went to the end. All right, Westminster Scrolls Trust, right? So 1964. Okay. So this is the, uh, the story. They were purchased in 1964 and they were sent to London. Now, many of you might remember actually in 1987, there was an exhibit that went around the United States. Uh, I think it went here to San Diego, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it was called the Precious Legacy Exhibit and a guy by the name of um, uh, Mark Talisman, who was an aide to one of the US, Sen uh, US Senators, Scoop Jackson, uh, arranged uh, for this exhibit to come out from behind the Iron Curtain and actually ended up here in the United States. It was a beautiful thing. And actually, this is a book that uh, has some of the pictures of that beautiful, some of those beautiful ritual items that came to the United States. But for 47 years, basically, uh, so what happened basically is the Memorial Scrolls Trust decided that they were going to allocate the scrolls that could be allocated and could be used to Jewish communities all over the world. And as I said, our community got two of them in 1970. And those scrolls came to us uh, in 1970, and this is a picture of a newspaper article that appeared in the local press of one of our, of one of our um, founding members uh, reading from the Torah school. Um, so uh, basically those scrolls came over on a Lufthansa flight in first class, by the way, very interesting. Uh, and they came to our community in 1970. And here they are right here. You can see the two scrolls on either side, the two tall ones. Uh, the one on the left is the one from Cheska Budyovica, and the one on the right, the one with the blue band around the outside, is the one from Olomots. Now, uh, just a little inside baseball here, you may have noticed the Chagura, the belt around the outside of the one on the right there. The one in the middle is not a Czech Torah score, by the way, just to point that out. Uh, but the one on the right uh, has a blue band around the outside there, and that means, that was a symbol to us, that the scroll over time had become pasul, or become uh, ritually unfit for us to be able to use. Without significant repairs, we the, the, the Torah scroll had, had become not kosher. And that oftentimes happens to Torah scrolls. They do need to be maintained over time. So in this case, just before we brought it back to all boats, the scroll was not kosher. And so we had the blue band around the outside there, just to remind us. By the, way. by the way, it was kind of interesting that there was some question as to which of the two big scrolls was which. Which one came from Olomots and which one came from Cheska Budyovica. And the reason was, that over time, over the, over the 47 years that we've had it, the Atzei Chayim, the uh, staves, the rollers on which the Torah scrolls have been on, have been actually changed. So we weren't 100% sure which one was which. And I'll tell you how we found out which one was which. But suffice it to say, the one on the right was the one from Obelos. So we decided to go through a process, as, as the rabbi had mentioned. We, we felt very strongly we wanted to return the scroll kosher. And as I said, the Memorial Scrolls Trust approached us, asked us to do it. We, of course, agreed. It was like a duh, you know, like, of course, we're going to do this. And so we went through a process of restoring the scroll. And this is a picture of what it looks like here. I've got some video in a second, which will give you an idea of what it kind of looks like. So the scroll went to Miami, Florida, which is where our soap fair was located. 
And he was fixing it for about six months for about uh, basically from the, from the end of 2016 until uh, we were about ready to go in 2017 to Olmots. And he was fixing the scroll. Now, something happened in Miami in September of 2017. And this is a big hint. There's something called Hurricane Irma. How many of you remember Hurricane Irma, right? It was the big hurricane. It was supposed to be the end of the world in Miami. It was a, <laughs> it's a pretty nasty looking hurricane here. And I was, you know, they were evacuating the entire city. They were sending people north. They were sending them to Georgia, to Alabama. Get out of town. It's the end of the world. Well, our Torah scroll was in Olomouc with our Sofer. And, you know, what he told us was that the scroll never left his possession. Right? Because this, this was a historic thing here. The fact that we were being asked for the first time to return a scroll to its ancestral home, and, and it was this scroll, that was a big deal. So what the Sophia told us was he actually wrote out the hurricane in his apartment in Miami. And you can sort of imagine him sitting there with the, you know, the scroll clutched to his chest with the power going out and everything. You know, we know what's going on in Texas now. Well, imagine what was going on in Miami because he, you know, he couldn't leave with a big Torah scroll. But that was Hurricane Irma. So not only did this scroll survive, you know, 200 years of history, not only did, did it survive the Nazis, not only did it survive 30 years of neglect, in that, in that dank warehouse in, in, in the Mishli Synagogue, but it also survived a hurricane, right? So this, this scroll's got good gifts, right? So this is our Sofer. His name is Rabbi Moshe Druin. He's from an organization called Sofer on Site. And uh, here's me with Rabbi Druin here. And I, I'm not gonna play the whole thing here, but I wanna give you a sense of what it sounds like to actually get the scroll replaced. He does a whole thing where he selects a word, he tells you what the word's about, he tells you what the what Chazal, what the, what the sages said about the word and why it's important and everything like that. I'm just going to play you a few seconds of sitting with Rabbi Druin uh, and um, fixing the scroll. So there's an interesting contradiction, an oxymoron type of a word. That's going to be yours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How's your Hebrew? Very good. Okay. No, so let's take a. Okay. So what's a dava? It's a star. It's a thing. Okay, so Devar really means multiple things. Yeah. Devar means a thing, right? It means Deber. Mm -hmm. So, and also means Deber. It means a, it's a, it's a, it's it's a, a play. play. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. hmm. So the tr truth is, this is actually, there's many Midrashim explaining. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there, the word Hadavar. Two for sure, I'm trying to think of the third one, that the only time the word davar exists in Torah. Because it'll say the word ledaber or whatever, but the word davar is such, dever it's all over the place. Ledaber is all over the place. But to say this is the thing, hmm. so here it turns around and saying this is where it actually turns around from a command into a choice. Okay, so I'm not going to play much more, but it was really a beautiful experience to sit with Rabbi Druin and to hear his learned explanations about what the words were. And what he would do basically is he would sit there with you and he would explain the, the significance and then he would fix the word in the Torah scroll. You can see he has his implements there to fix the Torah. I'll show you what that looks like later on in the presentation. So now we're on our way to Olamos. All right, so Rabbi Druin had brought the scroll to us in Foster City. Uh, he was actually gonna come with us to Olamos uh, to help us to fix the scroll. Uh, we, we basically fixed about 99% of the scroll, make it kosher. We left some of it unfixed so that the people in Olomots would have a chance to participate in the fixing of their own scroll. And we'll show you a little bit about what that looked like in a second. But this is us standing at San Francisco airport. There's a gala assemblage here. The guy on the left is a, um, a customer care supervisor from United Airlines. Uh, to his, uh, from, uh, le from left to right, we have uh, Cantor Daron Shapira. And I'll tell you a little story about Doron in just a second here. Doron has an amazing coincidence that goes on with him in Olomots. The guy in the center is Vic G, uh, Vic Lee, I'm sorry. He's a famous news reporter on ABC7 News. And it was kind of cool that he did a story about us from the airport, which actually ran as we were going over to Olomots on the plane, but I'll get that in a second. Then we have our synagogue president, Irene Ma, the rabbi in the check shirt, myself, and a woman named by the name of Andrea Heller, who was part of the United Airlines social media organization. So we were basically given the red carpet treatment by United Airlines. Now, 
I have never been to the Oscars before, right? I've never been to the Grammys. I've never been to the whatever. But I got to tell you that walking through the airport, being trailed by cameras and videographers was the closest thing that I've ever had to being on the red carpet in the Oscars. And here's a little bit of what it looked like right here. For tonight. So we had the paparazzi following us everywhere. It's really quite something with the city with the cameras and everything like that. It was very, very funny. So this guy here, the guy that was holding the seat for the safe for and by the way, notice that it's being carried in what I'm basically going to call a golf club bag, and that becomes important in just a minute when I tell the story here. But the guy who's uh, holding the Sepultura here, his name is Michael Hyatt, who uh, was a technical manager, he's a member of our synagogue, was a technical manager work, working for United Airlines. And Michael arranged with all of United Airlines, basically, to roll out the red carpet for us. Now, you remember back in 2017, United Airlines was having a tough time with some really bad publicity. Like you remember, they were dragging people off of airplanes and everything like that. So when they heard a good story like this, they knew this was a good story, right? Now, as I said, we had the paparazzi all over us here. So here's a pic here's a picture of um, Vic Lee, who is the uh, the guy interviewing our cantor, Daron Shapiro. He interviewed the cantor, he interviewed the rabbi, and we had the videographers and the press and everything was just all around us. Again, like like going to the Oscars. So this is what actually ran on ABC7 News as we were flying over to the Czech Republic. And I just want to play um, the, um, the video that ran. And it was really quite something. So here, here's the story that actually ran on ABC 7 News. Which restored a 200-year-old Torah that was seized by the Nazis is returning the artifact to its original home in the Czech Republic. It left today from San Francisco International Airport. And ABC 7 News reporter Vic Lee has the story you'll see only on 7. Okay, so this is not going to be able to go to x-ray. But the Torah was allowed through after a personal screening. In fact, this sacred Hebrew Bible is receiving the VIP treatment from United Airlines on its journey to the Czech Republic. The 200-year-old Torah has been at the Peninsula Sinai Congregation in Foster City since 1970. It came from a synagogue in a village called Olmutz in the Czech Republic, a village where Jews were murdered by the Nazis during World War II, their ritual artifacts confiscated or destroyed. But the Torah survived, and after the war, it made its way to the Westminster Synagogue in London, from there to the synagogue in Foster City. Today in Olmutz, the Jewish community there has rebuilt itself. And they've asked us if we would help restore this scroll to kosher status and bring it back to its home. And so it's a beautiful journey. These are the Ten Commandments right here. For Cantor Doran Shapira, all of this is an incredible coincidence. His wife's parents fled from Olmutz. This was their synagogue's Torah. I, as this suburban cantor in the Bay Area, have read from it myself for 20-something years, never knowing that. And if you look really closely, you can see some of the letters are still faded and cracked here at the top. The Torah still needs some restoring, something that will be done in its new home during a ceremony Sunday. In the meantime, its journey will be a comfortable one. Customer service were nice enough to uh, reserve its own seat for the Torah. And its own boarding pass. Vickley. ABC 7 News. So there's all kinds of stories about that there that went on there. So as I said, as you heard in, this, in the story there, Doron Arcantor, his wife's family by marriage came from Olomouc, and he didn't even realize it until we got connected with this whole story with returning the Torah to Olomouc. So that in and of itself was pretty strange. The other thing that was uh, very, very nice about United Airlines, they gave us a boarding pass for the Torah, and we actually still have the boarding pass. It's in the rabbi's office, and it said... On the boarding pass, it said United Airlines, Torah, Torah, seat 28C. So they gave the seat. They, they actually literally did reserve a seat for the Torah scroll. However, just a little bit of a, uh, to debunk that story a little bit, the Torah actually didn't ride in the seat uh, because it just would have been too ungainly to strap it there for the entire flight. So we actually put it in the overhead compartment in that golf club bag there. And it was surrounded by Tully Pope and very, very, very nicely packed there. Anyway, this is us, myself, the, the rabbi and the cantor at SFO with the Torah scroll. And it was in this golf club bag, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a, a quick funny story about that when we get to, when we get to um, uh, uh, Europe. 
So this is us on the plane. Uh, this is the entire flight crew uh, that's kind of gathered around. This is a beautiful picture that United took of our rabbi holding the Torah scroll next to the uh, plane that was taking us over, over to Europe. And th now this story is pretty cool here. This is the captain of our 777 that was taking us over to uh, Frankfurt. That was the first stop on our flight there. And basically, as we came out of the plane, they brought us onto the plane like 30 or 40 minutes early. And we were sort of VIPs, right? And so as we're getting settled and getting everything ready to get ready to go, the flight crew is crowded around us and asking, what is the deal with this story? They had heard about our story because the, um, the flight crew, the TSA, United Customer Care, the social media, everybody knew about our story. And so the pilot came out and wanted to hear the story. So here's a picture of the pilot. Her name is Captain Patty with our rabbi. And uh, it turns out that Captain Patty, this is her last flight. She was retiring immediately after that flight. So I just want to play a little brief little clip here of Captain Patty here. One of the things about this story, at every time we told this story, people got immensely emotional about it. And, and Captain Patty was no exception. She actually had tears going down her eyes as, as, she, as, we were tell, as the rabbi was telling her the story here. And we had to say, Captain Patty, please go fly the airplane. You know, we need you to get us there safely. But this is a brief little clip of Captain Patty. Let's try that again. It's about two hours outside of Prague. I'm going to give you my card. Okay. Is it for uh, the breast cancer awareness? It, the pink is yes. No problem. Yes, we will. And I'll send you this as well. So. You take hugs? I, just, I, I, give them. <laughs> I take them and give them. Thank you, Captain. <laughs> there, Captain. Right. So Captain Patty was trying to uh, take him up the story. And this is the picture of the boarding pass here. Tora Tora C-28C. It's a great memento, great souvenir, and we still have it in our inner community. Okay, one more thing happened before we actually took off here. As I said, we got on about 30 minutes early. Um, this is what I call eights on a plane, and I'm not going to say much more. I'm just going to play the video. time you sang eight time on a plane right so that was you saw the paparazzi everybody was taking pictures it really was quite something so just a couple of uh scenes here from the our flight over to frankfurt one thing i will say is it's about an 11 hour flight from san francisco to frankfurt and i had gotten wi-fi on my laptop because i had some work email that i had to look at on the way over and i figured well i'll get a little work done on the plane well when that abc7 news story the one that i played earlier ran my social media blew up I have never in my life seen it. And basically, I spent the entire 11 hours, I got maybe 15 minutes of sleep, responding to people. Oh, my God, did you see that? Oh, my God, did you see that? So it really, you know, it was already getting, it was already a big thing before we even left the country. So this is a picture of uh, our friend here, uh, got on one of the flight tracker apps and kind of was having some fun with us. He sent this to us on the plane. We got a good laugh over that. This is us on the plane here. This is Michael. My, Michael did not fly with us to Europe, by the way. Uh, but the rabbi of the cantor and I took the Torah school over to Europe. So what do you do at uh, two o'clock in the morning on a flight to overseas? Well, you got to daven shachrit. Uh, so here's Cantor uh, with the Talis and Phil and davening shachrit. And here's us when we finally got over to Frankfurt. And uh, Daron is holding the Torah scroll there. One thing about Daron is his mother is from Danzig, uh, from a from a uh, basically a, a, ger a German colony, uh, a part of Poland. Um, and uh, Daron had never been to Germany before. And so his very first steps, when, when we got off the plane in Germany, Jerome was carrying the Torah. So the very first steps of him in Germany in honor of his mother was him carrying a Torah scroll through Frankfurt Airport. So how's that for a little uh, little bit of a tearjerker there? One other thing I should mention about the golf bag, um, we had we had gotten to Frankfurt about eight o'clock in the morning and our flight to Prague, the uh, the onward flight on, uh, to the Czech, to Czech Republic wasn't until about one or two o'clock in the afternoon. So we had some time to kill. 
So we went over to the connecting gate for the flight to, uh, to Prague, and we, we basically took that golf club bag, and we, they had these bench seats in the terminal there, and there was nobody there. So we figured out, okay, we'll just put it on the bench seats. And so we're spacing out, we're checking our emails, we're you know, catnapping, you know, we're all jet lagged and everything like that. And as the flight uh, time approaches for the flight to Prague, the room starts filling up with people, right? And this one woman saw the, the, what he thought, what she thought were the golf clubs sitting on the seat in the terminal. And she said to us, she kind of gave us the stink eye. And she said to us, will you move your uh, 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 golf clubs off? The, I want to sit down. And we're like, no. No, not golf clubs. And so we tell her the story. And her, she's got tears coming down her eyes. But I have to tell you, that woman who the was giving us a stink eye was from Olomouc. Wasn't Jewish, but she was from Olomouc. And so we made a new friend, even with the golf club bag in the airport. So this is us once we arrived in Prague. This is uh, uh, Linda Oberstein in the center, who is a member of our shul. She was in, she was able to come with us, to be part of this experience here. And uh I'm not going to play this video here, but if any of you have been to Prague before, uh, one of the sites there, of course, is the iconic Jewish cemetery in Prague with all these tombstones that are kind of all over the place. Maybe I'll play just a couple of seconds here to see, get an idea of what it looks like. But it's a must-see uh, must thing when you go to Prague. You see all the tombstones kind of all over the place and kind of crooked and everything like that. Anyway, that's the that's the old Jewish cemetery in Prague. We don't have a lot of time to go through that right now. Okay, so to get to all about basically it was planes, trains, and automobiles, right? So here's the rabbi schlepping the Torah scroll to the car. Here's the rabbi schlepping the Torah scroll in the train station. Here's the rabbi putting the Torah scroll into another car. And here's the rabbi doing some more schlepping and some more schlepping on the train here. Now, just so you might think that the rabbi was the only person doing the schlepping, I actually did contribute a little bit to the schlepping, and here's me helping the rabbi, or at least trying to help. Uh, so we get on the train uh, uh, from Prague to Olmo. It's about two and a half hour train trip, and we got a little bit punchy uh, in the in, in, on, on the train trip there. We were getting a little bit jet lag, and so we came up with this little song here, which became one of the highlights of the trip, and I'll just play it really quickly for you. On my last train to Olmets and I'll meet you at the station. Got the Torah with us to protect the Hebrew nation. I'm on the train on the Olmets. I'm on the last train to Omits and I'll meet. Okay, so we were getting a little punchy at that point, but uh, you get the idea. We had a lot of fun with that song there. And actually, that's a song uh, from a group called the Monkeys from the 1960s, and we sort of adapted the words to the last song. So that was our little joke there on the train. So we finally get to Olomots. Here's the rabbi holding the Torah scroll in front of the train there. Here's um, uh, the rabbi slipping the Torah scroll again through the train station. And here he is at the hotel uh, in Olomots um, in preparation for the, uh, the festivities. Now, we were in Olomots basically from Thursday, actually from Wednesday night, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, sun, uh, Saturday and Sunday. We're basically there a long weekend. So um, this is the train station in Olomots where the last train to Olomots came into. Beautiful little building there. On Thursday night, uh, there was a gala ceremony in uh, Olomots that was attended by about 350 people. And this is a small sample of people in the room here. Unfortunately, all of it was in Czech. So I didn't really understand a lot of it. But it was a very nice little welcoming ceremony. And people came from all over the community, not just Jews, but all over the world came for this thing. It was a big deal. It was in, the, it was in all the, the newspapers, all the press and everything like that. It was quite something. So they brought in some rabbi from another community. He entertained us. He did some singing. He blew the shofar because it was uh, October. So it was just after the Chagim. Uh, so he blew the shofar for us. And uh, we had a gala kind of a welcoming ceremony. This is the rabbi and Jeffrey Ornstein, who's the chair of the Memorial Scrolls Trust. And we also celebrated Rosh Chodesh uh, uh, on Friday morning in Olomots. Now, we weren't able to take pictures over Shabbat. So this is the best I could do. But this is our on Friday morning during Rosh Chodesh, 
of our cantor Daron actually leading the davening uh, in the Jewish community in Olomos here. And these were pictures were taken by a photographer, a member of the community. And there's a very nice pictures here. This actually isn't the Torah scroll. This was a different Torah scroll that they had. Uh, but uh, because our Torah scroll had not been fixed, it was not kosher yet, so it couldn't be used for ritual purposes. And this is Peter Papushek uh, with his talis and tefillin, davening Rosh Chodesh. There's me looking oh, so interested in something. Maybe I was jet lagged, I don't quite know what. Um, again, a lot of, lot of jet lag here. <laughs> Putting the toilet, putting it, filling on, filling off. Uh, and this is basically what Rosh Hashanah looks like. The guy in the um, bottom left there is uh, the Orthodox rabbi of the Czech Republic. His name is Carol Seiden, and he joined us as well. So we had the chief rabbi of the Czech Republic uh, with us as well. Kind of an honor to have him here with as well. And there's a picture of me and uh, Ron Nestor. Ron is a member of our community uh, who also made the trip over with his wife. And we were talking about something very important. I can't remember what it was, but again, uh, we got caught on candid camera, and here's us davening uh, uh, Hallel on Rosh Chodesh uh, with Theron doing his thing here. Now, um, oh, this is Jeffrey Orenstein uh, also uh, davening in the shul. Um, now, I have a little video here of, of Hallel during Rosh Chodesh. Uh, I'm not going to play it. It's, it's too long here, but uh, Theron is leading Hallel during, during Rosh Chodesh, so it's kind of fun. Okay, so we've, we celebrate Shabbat, um, and um, one of the things, one of the, actually, the huge highlights for us was that the scroll, as I said, had come back to that community for the first time in 78 years. Now, one of the big emotional highlights for us was actually on Friday night. Uh, we were doing Kabbalat Shabbat in this small little cramped room, which is the prayer space of the Jewish community of Olamos. And we were sitting in that room, just crowded to the rabbi. The place probably holds 30 people. And we must have had 150 people in that room. I mean, it was just crowded. And I was sitting next to the sofa, Rabbi Druin, remember the guy who was uh, explaining how Dabar earlier, he came with us to fix the scroll. And I looked over to him at the end of the services, and what happened was the rabbi, our rabbi, brought the Olamot's Torah into the, into the prayer space for the first time in 78 years. And people were reaching out and kissing and, and crying, and, and it was just a tremendously emotional moment. And I, I turned to Rabbi Druin, and I noticed he was crying. And I said, what, why are you crying, Rabbi Druin? And he said to me, look, I've been fixing Sifrei Torah for 48 years, for almost 40 years. I have seen it all. I have heard every story. I've heard every, every anecdote. I have never seen anything like this. And so he was tremendously emotionally taken by the story of the Torah scroll coming back. So on Sunday morning, we actually commenced the actual fixing of the Torah scroll, the last 1% that needed to be fixed. And this is kind of what it looked like here. Uh, this is a picture of the chief rabbi with uh, Rabbi Druin uh, fixing his letter in the Torah. And you can see that the rabbi holds on to the, he's, he's actually holding on to the end of the, um, of the quill there as kind of metaphorically writing the Torah scroll, if you will, because we're commanded at, at least once in our life to write a Torah scroll. And so by actually um, euphemistically holding on to the quill, you're actually participating in running a Torah scroll. So this is the rabbi, the two rabbis actually fixing a, a thing in the Torah scroll here. And there were just hundreds of people in that room there. Uh, just a whole, a huge scrum. One of the people there was the um, Israeli ambassador to the Czech Republic. His name is Daniel Marin. Actually, he's the former ambassador. And his wife to the left there uh, is actually from Olomouc. We didn't know that, uh, but she's a native of Olomouc. And so here's the rabbi holding the Torah scroll once we had fixed it and made it kosher here. And here's a picture of Rabbi Corey and Drone getting their chance to fix a letter in the Torah. It really was tremendously meaningful. And I'm gonna to try to give you a little sense of what that looked like with our last video here. Now, one thing I did wanna show you here um, was there were people from all over the world that came to this thing. One of them was this woman here. Her name is Helga Smekalova. She's 87 years old and she was a survivor of Therezen. Now, remember I said about 90% of the Jews died in Therezen or in the death camps during the war, she was one of the lucky ones. She actually survived. And she came back and raised a family in Olomouc. And so here's her and her daughter explaining her life story to us. And it was tremendously moving to hear her story here, um, uh, her survival story and everything like that. It just was really something here. Now, I have a little video here, which I probably won't play too much of, but this is a picture of, um, of Helga kind of explaining her life story to us. It really was something. One more anecdote was, this is a gentleman by the name of Peter Brees. Peter Brees is 88 years old and he's from London, England. But as a boy, 
Peter Brees remembers, he's from Olomos, and he remembers as a boy of six, seven, eight years old, sitting in his father's lap, watching the rabbi read from the Torah scroll, right? That's pretty powerful stuff here. But he came actually from London to be part of this experience as well. So as I mentioned before, the very, very end was actually fixing the last letters of the Torah scroll. And here's a picture of Rabbi Druin and uh, Roman Gronsky uh, and the uh, hugs and kisses. And it was like, quite an emotional moment here. And I just want to kind of give you a little sense of it by playing a, a short video clip here of what that event looked like here. So this is actually fixing the last letters of the Torah scroll to make it a finally a kosher scroll. So here we go. What would be the words the Torah would say? Ki ga'a, I am so proud to be back home. Thank you. Thank, Thank all. all of us here. Everyone in your own way has helped to make this Torah proud once again. With great pride, in a few moments, we're going to march this Torah kosher back into the Aron Kodesh. That's to be proud. Are you ready? I'm ready. This is the moment. This is the moment. Okay. <laughs> you hold this. And by the way, it's not just ga'a, it's ga'o ga'a. It's the really highest, proud. it's really proud. <laughs> this is the top. And it only has this word like this once in the whole Torah. You could have come an hour ago, in two hours. It would, we, this is what we were waiting for. This was the letters that we are now finishing. Hold it right here. And say after me. L'shem. L'shem. No. I, everyone <coughs> say after me. L'shem. L'shem. Mitzvat. Mitzvat. Ketivat. Ketivat. Sefer. 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 Torah. Torah. We're now finishing the last remaining letters that need to be fixed in writing this Torah. Mazel tov, mazel tov. Mazel tov, mazel tov, mazel tov, mazel tov. I'm going to stop it right there. The mazel tovs and the cinnamon tovs went on for about 45 minutes. It was quite a quite a scene there. And you can see there's a, a big scrum of people around there. There must have been 200 people in that room there. And everybody, the photographers and the cameras, and it was really was quite something. Here. What would... Okay, so that was that. But then there was, we, we did Hagbab with the new scroll, the, the uh, kosher scroll. This is Peter Pavushik taking the scroll and doing Hagbab with the scroll. Very, yeah, you can see lots of people in the room. There was quite something, right? And then we had some dedication speeches. Uh, I'll play just a little snippet of one of these. This is our rabbi. Uh, just before we put the scroll, the kosher scroll back in the ark for the first time, our rabbi said a few words and I'll just play a few, a few seconds of this. It's kind of very nice. And when he comes out of the ark, God places a keshet in the heavens as a reminder, as, a, as an ot, as a symbol of the Brit, of the eternal covenant, the relationship between God and humanity. But the interesting thing about the keshet is that we can't always see it. And so Ibn Ezra, the great medieval Spanish commentator, Ibn Ezra, významný středověký španělský komentátor, he reminds us that even when we can't see it, God can. Nám nám připomíná, že i když my nemůžeme vidět tu druhu, to znamení té smlouvy, tak Bůh ji vidí pořád. And I was thinking about that symbolism in connection to the Torah. I'm going to advance it just a little bit to the end here, so you get an idea of actually placing the scroll back in the Torah in the uh, in the Aron Kodesh here. A bunch of speeches from a lot of people here. It was quite quite a moving moment. <laughs>
quite a moment, right? Uh, hundreds of people in that room there. It was a very, very emotional moment. And that was the moment that the scroll finally came home after 78 years. So one more little addendum here. Um, we did this in, uh, in October, 2017. In May of 2018, our rabbi led a group of people, a delegation from our community on a trip to Eastern Europe. And they went to Vienna, they went to Prague, they went to Warsaw, they went to Krakow. And on the way to Krakow, they made a pit stop in Olomouc so that members of our community could see and could dance with the Torah. And the community in Olomouc just rolled out the red carpet for us. And again, 40 members of our, of our, of our congregation were able to come and dance with the Torah in Olomouc. It, uh, it's still in use today in Olomouc. Last thing, um, this is a picture of what's called the United Hemispheres Magazine. It's one of those, it's that thing that sits in the seat pocket of your, uh, of your airplane when you, when you fly on United Airlines. Well, in December of 2017, they featured up a, a story about us in the United Hemispheres magazine, and this was on five continents. So our story got out all over the world. And I actually had somebody that um, made a copy of, uh, that, that took a copy of this from one of the, one of their flights and got the flight crew to autograph it. And so they sent, uh, their, their, you know, they autographed the article and they said things like, Oh my God, this is such an amazing story. I can't believe it. On and on and on. And on. So I hope that I've been able to share with you just a little taste of what it was like there. There's so much more to the story. There's so many more layers to the story, but um, it truly was an amazing experience. And I wanna thank you for your patience in helping us to share our story. And now if there are any questions, I'll go to the chat or maybe just ask you to unmute yourself and um, let's, uh, let's take any questions that you have. I'm just looking through the chat here. Uh, let me stop the share here. Yeah. Thank you so much. You made it so interesting and you're such a great talker. It's a okay. great story and a, you're okay. a great storyteller. Um, you know what? We start every meeting with a Torah, with Parashat Shavua. That's who we are. That's us. That's what unite and keep us all together. Thank you so much. And uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> what about the other Sefer Torah that you said? The good, it's a good question. So the other Sefer Torah still is in our community. It's a community, it's a scroll that comes from that town called Cheska with the open so Again, we know it's from that community because it was cataloged by the, uh, the curators in the, in the Jewish Museum in Prague. Um, I've actually been to Cheska. It's about two hours south of Prague. I showed you on the map there. It's on the way to a very interesting site called Chesky Krumlov, which is sort of like First Castle. Uh, beautiful site. I had to recommend if you go to, the, if you go, to, go to the Czech Republic, go to Chesky Krumlov. But on the way to Krumlov was uh, Cheska Budyovica, and I arranged with the guide who was taking us there to stop there. So I actually visited um, the community in Cheska Budyovica, uh, and so that community is basically, and I hate to use the word, but it's, it's Judenrein. There's, there's no Jews. Um, you know, um, nobody survived the war. There's no, the synagogue building actually in Cheska Budyovica, similar to Olomos, was blown up by the Nazis in 1942. So there's only a monument to that synagogue, and that's it. There's no Jews. There's no Jewish community. There's no nothing there. So the chances are that that, that, that forest called that second one that we have from the Memorial School Trust, it's probably going to stay with us because there's no chance it's ever going back to Bolivia. So, Steve, um, Ben, Steve, thank you so much. And you, you can see how many people put in their chat. Amazing story, great story. But you gave us so many details, so we feel as if we traveled with you. And um, I think we're ready to move on. And Steve, you have come to our program again. You thank always. You. Welcome to come on our program as a guest speaker and people can always ask you more questions and we can talk more. Uh, yeah, you can see incredible story from everyone. So stay with us because now um, 